Welcome to my series, a simplex converted to a Great Western Railway Prairie Tank. This is part 80, working on the small yet important jobs. Previously I removed the paint from the front part that fits in between the frames and covers the oil pump. And then very gently I modified the position of this copper part using a soft hammer. I'm filling the indentation that was there before I attacked it with the hammer with JB Weld. Using my Proxon motor tool as usual, I cleaned up the part using one of those paper grinding discs that I showed in the last episode. I would like to mount a couple of these at least on the front of the engine. I buy these from Blackgate's Engineering and they are lost wax castings of Great Western style railway lamps. Great Western railway lamps, as far as I can see, were different to everyone else's. Instead of the mounting fitting being at the rear, as is normal, Great Western Railway lamps have the mountings at the side. The only problem is, I do find that a lot of the time, the main brackets on the engines are too thick to fit in these mountings, so they need a little bit of trimming. This is no exception. I started off with the needle file, then I used the grinding wheel, which really didn't work too well, and I was in danger of destroying the part. If I make it too thin, the lamp will be a rattle fit, and if I make it really thin, the mounting will probably break, it's only made from brass. I found it quite difficult to get the needle file to be level all the time. So I used a larger file, with very fine teeth, which made short work of the bracket. The bracket was now the right width, but still a bit thick. So to save a bit of time, I used my Proxon angle grinder to thin it out a little bit. And I also used the angle grinder to thin out and shape the end. I didn't finish the job with the angle grinder, for that I used the file once again. And the bracket now fits perfectly into the lamp and holds it in place even when it's upside down and I'm shaking it. As you can see, the lamp is a firm push fit on the bracket. This simplex masquerading as a Great Western Railway Prairie Tank is very standoff scale and completely wrong in many ways. But small accessories like these make all the difference. You have to stick the lens in the front of the lamp for whether you want it to be a lamp for the front or for the rear. And as it says on the instructions, do not use cyano-based adhesives, that means super glue. There are two more lamp brackets, one on each running board. And just by looking at these I can see that they're a bit thinner than the ones in the centre. The one on the left hand running board is a little bit tight in the lamp. But I think if I remove the paint and just clean up the bracket it should be okay. Just a quick touch with the needle file should fix this, I think. I don't want to file this down too much because the last thing you want is a loose lamp bracket. When the engine is rattling down the track, the last thing I would want to happen is for the lamps to fly off. I didn't need to do anything at the right hand one. The lamp fitted perfectly and once again it's a really snug, almost tight fit. I'll fit the lenses later using some epoxy resin. 24 hours after I applied the JB Weld to the countersunk screws, which reinforced the cab, it's time to rub down the JB Weld, just leaving it in the countersunk areas. Initially I did this by hand with a piece of emery cloth, but it took a while. I don't think this JB Weld will be invisible anyway, I'll probably have to go over it with some cellulose stopper. But the job is definitely going in the right direction now. I thought I would try the angle grinder with the flapper wheel fitted, just to remove the bulk of the JB Weld. Then finish off the job using coarse emery cloth as I did on the first bit. I'm doing this in a very light and controlled way. I don't want to make any grooves in the metal. And as you can see, there's still quite a lot of JB Weld to rub off with the emery cloth. I have a couple of rolls of emery cloth and one of them is 100 grit. That's a little bit coarse. This I think is 135 grit and it's about right. It scratches the metal nicely. When building miniature steam locomotives, the choice of metals is a bit of a minefield. Most paint is reluctant to stick to brass, and even the etching primer that I use is not designed for brass, it's designed for ferrous metals. While I'm talking about the choice of metals, I'm cleaning up the other side. As I was saying, you're between a rock and a hard place. If you use steel, that's okay, but if ever the paint chips, then water can get under the steel and start to creep about, and before you know it, you have a really weird looking engine. What about stainless steel? Well, it's the same again. Paint doesn't like stainless steel and doesn't stick to it very well. So I'm going to live with the brass part of this engine, 
Of course, the boiler isn't made from brass, that's made from copper. You have to give the paint a chance. You need to give it a chance to harden thoroughly before using the engine, and then the heat from the boiler will usually bake the paint on over a period. In the last episode, I could only fit half of the roof in my tub of cellulose thinners. 24 hours later, and the paint's more or less fallen off. I left this old paintbrush in the cellulose thinners, and uh, I don't think the bristles liked it much. No trickery here, this is just as I found the roof after 24 hours in a bath of cellulose thinners, and the paint just drops off the metal. This is the underside, and even a sheet of paint is coming off that wasn't actually submerged. I must caution users of cellulose thin as I do from time to time. This is not nice stuff to use, it really smells bad. Most of the time when you see me using it, I'm by a wide open door in the outer part of the workshop. You must never use this if your area isn't well ventilated. I like using it for this job though, it's very non-invasive, it just gently tells the paint to go away. It's not good to touch it with your finger because apparently it soaks in through your skin, but I don't do that. A lot of health and safety comments really are common sense. It's always important to wear eye protection even for this job. I'm using an electric toothbrush to remove the stubborn areas. And this can cause localised splashing. And another possibly more obvious health and safety rule. After using your electric toothbrush in a bath of cellulose thinners, it really is not a good idea to clean your teeth with it. This is the workshop's electric toothbrush. In my bathroom, I use a manual toothbrush, so it would be quite difficult to get them mixed up. This roof has a removable panel, which you remove when you drive the engine, but someone's removed it and lost it, so I'll have to make another one. A term that I frequently hear from potential customers wanting me to do jobs on their engines is, I have this engine and it's 99% complete. And just to clarify and put this statement into perspective, this is episode number 80, and I would say that the job is now about 99% complete. Until something goes wrong, but I won't be pessimistic, I'll just say that's it for now. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.